The Dust Bowl was one of the longest lasting, most devastating, most awful environmental disasters in the whole of world history. What made it worse was economic depression, the Great Depression, which happened at the same time. People all over the United States suffered from famine, from poverty, from unemployment. And then the dust, which suffocated them, which blinded them, and made life unbearable enough to trigger a massive migration from their homes into the safety of the West Coast. One of the worst parts about this whole natural disaster is that it wasn't natural. It was man-made, or at least it was made possible by man. Before we start, I would like to ask you all to subscribe to this channel and like the video. It really does help. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans and immigrants from all over the world traveled west. They believed in the idea of manifest destiny, that America was meant to expand and expand west to conquer basically the whole of North America, and that this expansion was ordained by God. The American government also supported this idea, and they passed the Homestead Act in 1862, giving any settler who hadn't fought against the federal government in the Civil War 160 acres of government land for free. The government supported settlement of the West, and especially rewarded farmers who would help settle the frontier. Soon massive overhunting, over farming, and all around overuse of the land began. This overuse was supported by the popular idea that rain follows the plow, that no matter where anyone farms, that prosperity will follow, and that the environment would adapt to them instead of them having to adapt to the environment. This idea was wrong, but they didn't know it, and they didn't listen to those who did. They plowed and they plowed. They removed millions of acres of grass from the plains to plant corn and wheat. But what they didn't know is that the top soil of the plains was only really being held down by this grass. Small, many dust storms happened all throughout the 1860s to the 1930s. Yet for all the hardships, dust bowls and everything else, the settlers didn't seem to learn from their mistakes. And they continued to do what was bringing about these disasters in the first place. Settlers continued their farming. They grew wheat and grew even more of it after it came in higher demand than ever before during World War I. They cleared millions of acres of land for this wheat and corn too and they harvested it. But when they harvested it, they didn't plant something else in its place and so these vast expanses of land had nothing holding it down afterwards. Now this isn't preferable under any circumstances, but it's survivable. When the wet weather of winter, fall, and spring comes around, the moisture will help to hold down this otherwise loose soil. But say it stops raining, or there was a drought. You can imagine these huge pieces of land, loose dirt, nothing holding them down, whole areas which were super dry. That is what makes perfect conditions for a dust bowl. In 1929, the depression started. Suddenly, thousands of farmers who had been sending wheat overseas to Europe suddenly no longer had a market there. The price of wheat dropped dramatically, and so farmers started tearing up even more land, making more room for more wheat to make up for lost prices. Other farmers decided to cut their losses and get out of the prairie. There wasn't much more money to be made there. Soon, many of the other farmers who thought they could keep up with the rapidly dropping prices, they left too. They invested too much time, too much money, with way too little return. Besides what this meant for the thousands of families out there on the plains who relied on these crops, this land, and the now crumbling economy, this also meant that a huge amount of land, besides the long stretches where they just weren't being farmed, now just wouldn't be farmed. Now, as I said earlier, these big stretches of empty land, nothing holding them down, 
definitely was not preferable, but it could be survivable so long as there was enough moisture in the soil and in the air. In 1930, the region entered a drought. Now, everything had gone wrong. Everything that could go wrong had, and the conditions were perfect for a massive dust bowl, one that the infrastructure of the plains just wasn't built for, one that many would not survive, and one that the people of the plains already suffering from the worst depression the world economy had ever seen were not prepared for. This drought would last a decade, and as the years wore on, the drought would worsen and so would the oncoming dust storms. The Dust Bowl began gradually, and after years of these conditions getting to just the right point for the perfect storm. It's hard to say when the first dust storm, or even dust storms, began, but the first ones reported to the Weather Bureau were in late January of 1932. These storms swept across the plains, bringing destruction with them. Winds carrying the dust reached 60 miles per hour and reached 10,000 feet in the air. These clouds were thick. You couldn't see through them, and you couldn't see feet in front of yourself if you were in one. The particles of dust were incredibly small, 63 microns, about the diameter of a strand of hair, barely visible to the human eye. As storms got worse, the dust began taking its toll on living things. One quote reads, The dust was beginning to make living things sick. Animals were found dead in the fields, their stomachs coated with two inches of dirt. People spat up clods of dirt as big around as a pencil. An epidemic raged through the plains. They called it dust pneumonia. Many wore thick masks and goggles to protect their lungs and their eyes. If you didn't, who knows what would happen to you. Dust pneumonia was sometimes deadly. Sometimes it would sicken you so bad that you couldn't work, you couldn't farm, you couldn't provide or do much of anything. In most scenarios, it was serious and life-threatening. Clouds of grasshoppers ravaged whatever crops hadn't already been killed by the dust. Often, these clouds of grasshoppers were just as big and just as destructive as much of the dust clouds. As storms raged on, the months and the years went by, these giant dust storms only worsened. Giant clouds of dust reached far as Chicago, New York, and even D.C. These cities were soon coated in dust, like the whole of the Midwest was. Back in the heartland of the country, some days were so bad that they were just black, absolute black. You couldn't see feet in front of you. You couldn't drive, you couldn't risk walking without walking right into something. You could be nose to nose with someone else and not know it. One morning, called Black Sunday, of April 14th of 1935, locals of Boise City woke up to a clear sun in the sky. This was a fairly common thing at this point in the Dust Bowl, but as this day went on, the temperature quickly dropped and a dark cloud appeared on the horizon. This might mean one of two things. Either rain was coming, which might help to put an end to the dust storms, or it was a massive cloud, so big that it blocked out the whole of the horizon. It was dust. Wind carried the massive cloud at an upwards of 60 miles per hour. The whole of the Texas panhandle was consumed by the dust. If you stuck your own hand out in front of your face, you could not see it. Children, grown men and women, wandered out into this dust and would never come back. Some fortunate ones found shelter in abandoned buildings. Layers of dust, sometimes two feet deep, covered roads, making driving impossible even after the storm passed. This was Black Sunday, the worst day of the Dust Bowl. When the dust clouds reached Washington, D.C. weeks before Black Sunday, an advisor to President Roosevelt, Hugh Bennett, was talking with Congress about soil conservation, about putting an end to the Dust Bowl. Clouds of dust at this point hung over D.C. They traveled 
the hundreds of miles to the capital, thick enough to darken the daylight and blot out the sun. After hours of trying to get Congress to pass the president's agenda on conservation, Bennett simply pointed out the window during his testimony towards the dust-covered sky and said, This, gentlemen, is what I have been talking about. Congress passed the bill. FDR had taken office in 1933, taking on the burden of the Depression, the Dust Bowl, and countless other responsibilities that the presidency already comes with head on. Immediately, Roosevelt knew the plains would be a priority. He was able to create the Soil Erosion Service in the Department of Interior, later the Soil Conservation Service in the Department of Agriculture. These services educated over 40,000 farmers on the plains of responsible farming techniques and incentivized the use of these techniques, halving the amount of eroded land on the plains. He enlisted the civilian conservation boys to plant 220 million trees, securing some of that loose topsoil in a straight belt across six states from Texas to North Dakota. His administration also bought 40,000 acres of eroded land and made it back into its natural grasslands. For all the effort, successful effort, FDR's administration put towards eliminating the Dust Bowl, ending the drought, and creating jobs, oftentimes it just wasn't enough. The Dust Bowl had come about gradually, and it wasn't going to go away overnight either. The same could be said about the depressed economy. The Dust Bowl had destroyed the major industry of the plains, farming. Most of the jobs were now on the west coast in California in the vineyards, and many took work wherever they could. A mass migration from the plains, and especially the southern plains of Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and Texas began, with thousands, millions even, moving to California. These immigrants were called Okies. They were treated as inferior, as trash. Their working conditions were awful, often illegal. They were paid practically nothing. Most lived in massive homeless camps called shanty towns or Hoovervilles on the side of roads, under bridges, or anywhere else they could find. The few who remained in the plains didn't do much better. They were often unable to feed themselves or even to keep their house as they were unable to pay for any of these things. While Roosevelt's efforts, combined with state and local efforts to quash the Dust Bowl, were effective, and by 1939 the droughts ended with the fall rains, the region has never been the same. The whole of the country was back to normal rainfall by the early 1940s. We were out of the drought. Around the same time, America joined in on World War II. The Depression was over, and so was the Dust Bowl. They had both come in together, and now they were out together. Those who had survived the Dust Bowl, the Depression, are one of the strongest generations we have ever had especially those few who had the audacity to stay in the plains for the whole of the time. These survivors stayed by their own will, by their own grit, by their optimism. As one Kansan said, we have faith in the future. We are here to stay. For all we learned from the Dust Bowl, many fear we are on the verge of repeating it. Some say the plains have forgotten all those hard-learned lessons from the years of hardship. On a larger scale, we are entering an age of climate crisis. Climate change is bound to drastically change the world economy, the environment, and even life on a smaller, individual level. This, I think, is one of the most serious, most relevant, and most threatening real-world examples of if we do not learn from our history, we are bound to repeat it. If we do not correct our path, if we do not quit our overambition and attempts to dominate our earth, we are headed towards a whole new world of hardship and pain. Thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And I'm going to ask again, 
that you please subscribe to this channel and like this video if you enjoyed it. I put the links to all the sources used in the making of this video in the description. Thank you again for watching. Goodbye.